Let's do this. The Cult of Hockey podcast by the faithful and for the faithful. I'm David Staples of the Edmonton Journal, and I'm here today with the Big Mac, (laughs) Bruce McCurdy. Hey, Bruce. Hey, David. How are you doing today? Do they call Paul McCartney the Big Mac? I have I a friend know. who's a huge Beatle fan. And he always oh, calls yeah. him the Big Mac. I wonder. Oh, if, really? I just wonder if that's his nickname or if anyone else called him the Big Mac. Anyway, uh, yeah. Um, how you doing, Bruce? Oh, I'm all right this morning, David. How about yourself? Fantastic, Bruce. Beautiful day out there today. Yeah. I'm already out skating this morning. Oh yeah. Got my morning Great. skate in. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Um. June, it must be hockey season. It is. It is. Working on my backwards skating, Bruce. I have to say, like, if you're an older hockey player, as I am, uh, I don't know if I mentioned this before on the podcast, but I improved my skating more in two months than I have in my entire life right. by doing a simple thing that a dumb, I think I had mentioned this, that a dummy like me had never done, which is stretching. Oh, and yeah. if you don't, if you are older and you haven't stretched before regularly, man, that is the best thing you can do in terms of increasing your agility and um, flexibility. It just makes it easier to move everything you do in life, but particularly hockey skating, because you really have to get down low to skate. So that's my recommendation to all you uh, young, old and in between hockey players. Stretch every single day for 15, 20 minutes. And it's it's fantastic huge advantage of course most people know that i'm kind of late to the party on this bruce i think stretching's been around a while eh? yeah yeah i've heard of it all right <laughs> well that's weird now i just have okay two pictures there we go there we go all right bruce we're gonna do we're gonna we're gonna do kind of a roundup of the latest oilers news in this podcast so there's lots mm-hmm. to talk about there's evander kane's goodbye note so maybe a goodbye note maybe not anyway some of us had that feeling reading the note that it was a goodbye note Mm -hmm. there's um season ending press conferences from jay woodcroft and ken holland there is a the ever broiling boiling bubbling brewing controversy around yesa pulley and um there's one other controversy that came up we'll start with that bruce let me just go to the story Right after the Edmonton Oilers lost, and this is kind of old news. You're, we've been talking about this in Edmonton for a bit, but we'll, in case you, there's lots of people who listen from around the world and they might not be as versed in this. Right after the Oilers lost, both the Sportsnet and the score came out with pretty uh, insulting tweets that denigrated both the Oilers and, and their fans to some extent. Um, so the score, the score's tweet um, was they had a, it's just a spray painted image. It was the Oilers' crest. And it's spray painted over, instead of saying Oilers in their uh, typical font, it said Losers. So that's what the score did. And then uh, Sportsnet had a one where they um, where they had um, an Oilers, a, a guy walking through a bog towards the Stanley Cup. <clears throat> and as he was reaching for the cup, and he has a huge Oilers logo over his head, replacing his head, he falls face down in the mud and over top, flies this ab symbol with a, a broom indicating sweet. So mm-hmm. it, again, it was wow. kind of, it was like, so many people asked like, okay, did you do that for any other team when they got eliminated? Right. Why are you, why are you taking this shot at the Oilers who had a pretty more successful season than any other Canadian hockey team this year? Um, won two big series against Colorado, or excuse me, against Calgary and Los Angeles, and were pretty banged up, frankly, by the time they played the Avs. Not that the Avs didn't pick up a major injury in that Nazem Kadri going out, but <clears throat> with Leon Dreisaitl and Darnell Nurse, like there's three key players on the Oilers. There's Nurse, Dreisaitl, and McDavid. Two of the three were, were playing at 50%, Bruce. Uh, you know, ner- we now know it's been confirmed Leon Dreisel had a high ankle sprain. Darnell Nurse was playing with a torn hip flexor. And um, I don't know what that even is, but that sounds like the reason you stretch is so you can get your so you can get down low and get mm-hmm. loosen up those hips 
to skate mm-hmm. properly. If you can't, if you got a torn hip flexor, I mean, how can you even skate? Like, so the courage, and, and I had been critical of them all through this the playoffs, Bruce, these two players uh, in terms of some of their play and usage. But by the end, I was, you know, it was really impressive and gutsy that they both played and were as effective as they were. So for these two sports networks to do this, I mean, who, who does that? Who mm-hmm. insults their customers in such a way? We have paying customers for both of these outlets in Alberta. What was your take on it? What did you think? Yeah, well, the one from the score was tasteless. Uh, now, that now that former channel was taken over by Sportsnet as uh, Sportsnet 360. Uh, but there's some discussion about, I mean, if it was Sportsnet 360, they would have changed their uh, uh, their logo and so on on the Twitter feed. And there's, there's some discussion about who actually is that Twitter feed. But the one from Sportsnet themselves is pretty unambiguous in the sense that uh, uh, not only are they a national, one of the two main national sports broadcasters, uh, uh, they have uh, uh, the 12-year contract on the NHL and they have exclusive rights to the Oilers. They are the rights holders. Uh, The Rogers name is on the building here in Edmonton. There's a big Sportsnet lounge at one end of the ice. I mean, their fingerprints are all over the team for better or worse. And it just seems an odd decision by whoever, and I'm suspecting uh, some intern on the overnight shift in Toronto uh, coming up with that with the idea. And of course, the tweet later was uh, deleted amidst much uh, uh, harsh feedback coming from this part of the world. And of course, people in other parts of the country loved it. But uh, you know, 90% of the people can love it and 10% can hate it. But if uh, a chunk of the 10% are prepared to vote with their wallets, that is a poor corporate decision. And to me, this wasn't just fans, you know, uh, trolling other fans. This was a business that was sort of trolling itself and its own business interests. It was a really dumb thing to do. And uh, insulting is, a, you know, goes <laughs> it's part of that. But... Uh, what the hell were they thinking or was he thinking or she thinking or whoever was in charge of the social media account that night and other than deleting the tweet what else have we heard from uh, Sportsnet in t- terms of an explanation or apology or any of that stuff so it's we, just we've not heard a good, nothing not a good not a good look for Sportsnet yeah listen up your act. I've had enough years on Twitter to know you, you sometimes make stupid tweets Mm-hmm. You I'm see, done. sometimes most people, almost everyone on Twitter who's on a lot, have have done it. Make make a tweet they regret. It's it, I, I think deleting the tweet is a like a good idea. If you make a mistake, try to correct it. But you should also apologize. Like they should also explain and apologize. Now, there's rumors like that this is a former Toronto Maple Leafs uh, employee that I've I've heard that floating around out there. I don't know the the truth of that, but they listen. They want. They are a business partner. They are. They're trying to be a classy outfit, and they generally are. I mean, they they generally like like the, the reporters. Um, um, like you know, they had that panel: Bieksa, Rudy Friedman, mm-hmm. uh, Ron McLean, who I personally have never forgiven for his betrayal of Don Cherry, um, and uh, Jennifer Botterell. Mm-hmm. They're fantastic. They are, they are, generally speaking, they are unbiased. Bex is particularly excellent at breaking down the game, and he's starting to get into that more. He's, he's, a, he's, he's, a, he's kind of a treasure, I think, because of his candor and hockey knowledge. Um, locally, they have uh, Gene Principe and Mark Spector, and they, those two guys are going to bear the brunt of this. You know, through no fault of their own, they're going to hear this for years, Bruce. Mm-hmm. They're, this, this image now of Sportsnet which is already kind of percolating a lot. You know, there's already the doubts about the Toronto media, not about Sportsnet in particular, but about people in Toronto taking shots at Edmonton constantly. McDavid's going to leave, blah, blah, blah. Like that always comes, almost always comes out of Toronto sources. And, um, you know, it's so there's already frustration and a doubt. Um, there's, a, there's a feeling that there's too much emphasis on the Maple Leafs, on all these networks. So on top of that, you now provide tangible proof, not just doubts or questions about, you know, where, you know, 
the emphasis or the loyalty of a, of a network, but proof that at least a few people, one person there is this goofball who thinks it's it, it's funny to insult the Edmonton Oilers, um, mm-hmm. Canada's most successful team this year, and uh, the, their last, fans. St- last team standing, yeah. Yeah, so what's... Let's celebrate another American Stanley Cup. Yeah, Stomping Sportsnet. Graves. Yeah, Sportsnet <laughs> should apologize, and they haven't yet. And because they haven't, I'm less inclined to forget it and, and more inclined to keep talking about it and to bring it up again. I was ready. To, I would drop it if they apologized. I'd drop it in a second because I think that's the right standard for people when they screw up on social media. We do it. People do it all the time. And we. I think we need more forgiveness of people who make mistakes in terms of this kind of thing. Even this, like this, it's nothing really on a certain level. It's nothing if you just get rid of it and then apologize for it. People will move on. But I don't think because they haven't done so, they, they deserve to keep, you know, the beatings will stop when they when they make amends for it. They have yet to do so. So. That's my take. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't. I don't necessarily share your high opinions of everybody on the panel, but I do like uh, some aspects of it. I'm. I. Uh, I think Biaxa adds a lot. I'm. I'm a fan of Jen Botterill. I think she's done a really, really solid she, job. I agree, and, Bruce. Ac- she's uh, excellent. She is excellent. And uh, of the others, uh, Rudy. I, I like him on the personal level. I'm not always thrilled with his. Uh, his commentary and and uh, I think there may be some biases uh, built in there, but uh, any anyway, flames flames fan, yeah, yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, be that as it as it may, I mean, they're the face of the uh, of the uh, uh, organization, but I mean, this is in one sense it's a business and it's a corporation, and it's kind of kind of sullied itself and going in this direction and you know it's uh time to clean up your act there a little bit sports net focus on the good things you do and uh try and stay away from this kind of troll <coughs> crap. yeah all right let's move on um how about we talk about uh the other thing that's kind of pop of mind well we'll, we'll actually we'll start with um jay woodcroft's press conference bruce Sure. All right. Is there is there one thing? Do you want me to go first, or is there one yeah. thing that's still from that press conference that you want to talk about? Uh, well, I think the one thing that stood out uh, is uh, um, the overall approach of of Woodcroft and indeed of the people asking him the questions that. He, I mean, he's still officially technically the interim coach of the Edmonton Oilers uh, with a contract that I, I think would run out at the end of this month or, you know, at the, at the crossover date uh, between the end of this season's official business and next season's, if it might be a first part of July. Uh, but the assumption and just the overall presentation is he's the coach, he's going to remain the coach. He, you know, he, he was talking in terms of this year, but moving forward. And I think that, you know, it's, uh, I guess we'll get to this a little bit when it gets to Ken Holland, but I think Ken Holland's number one priority uh, in the coming uh, days and weeks is the retention of the coaching staff that brought this team uh, more success than we've enjoyed <coughs> in the city in 16 years. And uh, they were able to turn things around pretty quickly. And with a with a uh, 21st century approach, which shines through in basically all of Jay uh, Woodcroft's uh, media avails, you know, be it you know game days, practice days, uh, exit interviews like this one was. Uh, he's, uh, I think, he's a man that uh, uh, the team can build its future around, and uh, uh, with the able assistance of Dave Manson, who I think uh, also did a pretty fine job on this team. I mean, ultimately, it came apart against the uh, Avalanches, so uh, we will discuss. But uh, they uh, uh, they are the path forward. And I think basically everything that came out of that avail was, you know, that this is not the end, but this is just, you know, the end of the first step. And now we move on from here. There was an interesting moment with Woodcroft in one of the um, press conferences. I think 
I, I can't remember the exact reporter, so I won't say, but one of the reporters referred to him as referenced him as a hockey nerd. Mm-hmm. And um, Woodcroft took a bit of exception to it, like mm-hmm. and not just in fun, like he was because I think he's sensitive to that, right? Because he's not mm-hmm. a former NHL player. Right. Uh, he came up, you know, he's a video guy initially. Mm-hmm. But he is he is from that Ontario school of hockey, which is, you know, there's a couple different schools of hockey. There's the Claire Drake School of Hockey here in Edmonton, which has had many outstanding coaches attached to it. Um, many people, including the owner's organization, have learned a ton from that Claire Drake School. But there's another school in Ontario, the kind of the Roger Nielsen School. And these are, um, you know, they're not traditionally former NHL players, a lot of these guys. They're just f- intense hockey fanatics who are teachers, who um, know, come to learn the teaching both the technique and the strategy of hockey inside out. And also were founders of the analytics movement movement in hockey. It was Roger Nielsen who first um, took analytics to a different level with his vi- review of video plays, looking at scoring chances, breaking them down, figuring who's, who, you know, how many scoring chances his team had, how many the other team had, who's involved in them, who's not involved in them. This is all Roger Nielsen's uh, influence. And I think Woodcroft is definitely from this school of hockey. And they are on a certain level. Like, I can see why they're called hockey nerds. But it's that's a way of denigrating them. Like, it's not, that's not a compliment. What these guys are, are they're, they are intense hockey fanatics. Mm-hmm. That's what Jay Woodcroft is. And they are intense hockey teachers. And they're, they also study, I think, um, they study, so they study all aspects of the game, including communication, how to deal with the modern player. And this is what impressed me with Jay Woodcroft, is his framing of his players in the game constantly in a positive light and building people up, building up their confidence. And I was, I was most, I was very impressed actually with how he dealt with the question of yes, a pulley RV. Pulley RV has been under a lot of criticism. A um, lot of people um, questioning his, his play in the last few months, mainly, and, and Woodcroft did a great job of defending the player as it came up talked about how Pugliarvi uh, had done well when he first came to the team and had some success, but then he had a major lower body injury that impacted his skating. Then he had a COVID, non-COVID-related uh, um, illness that kept him out a week. And the linger, lingering effect of that, uh, Woodcroft noted and, and, and thought that was a contributing factor. And he wasn't trying to hide the fact that Pugliarvi was subpar in the mm-hmm. playoffs. Anyone watching Pulley RV, if you don't see that in Pulley RV, like you're not a fair observer of this player either then. Like who's ever, there's someone who might say, well, he was just as good in the playoffs. I don't know if anyone's saying that, but he wasn't. He was mm-hmm. definitely down, a, a, like he was half the player, honestly, that he was in the regular season, according to our our analysis of his two-way play through grade A shots. I mean, it, it was cut in half his effectiveness. So there was a problem. It has to be addressed, but Woodcroft did a great job. And the thing he said best, Bruce, is that he he neither he, whatever was going on with Yessa, neither he nor his teammates lost confidence in Yessa Pulleyarvi, and what a great thing to say as the coach. You know, we we I have your back. Your teammates have your back. That is what a, a young player needs to hear, and that mm-hmm. that's the brilliance of Jay Woodcroft. I think is along with all of his other technical abilities in hockey, he is a great communicator and a great motivator. And I, mm-hmm. I came to have a some real respect for him in, in that regard. And I think that's how he might separate himself somewhat from um, the older generation of coaches that the Oilers have had who, who may or may not uh, be a bit more gruff in their style. I, I can't say. I mean, I think Tippett actually, Dave Tippett, is, you know, was a great student of the game as well and, and kind of comes from, you know, learned from both the Drake School and the Nielsen School as he went along as a player, like he's heavily influenced by, by both of those schools of hockey in Canada. But um, Tippett, I think, it, or excuse me, uh, Woodcroft is a modern communicator and, and has a real gift for that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I do like his, uh, his positivism and uh, he doesn't throw any players under the bus. I mean, we'll recall uh, Dave Tippett's comments about Mikko Koskinen uh, this past January, which, you know, weren't really good. And I mean, it's not just the player who gets thrown under, under, but it's, you know, a ripple effect in terms of what happens to his uh, um, 
teammates and you know how they perceive uh what's going on and in the case of um uh jay woodcroft never happened uh, i can't think of an instance where he said anything about a player that could uh be taken negatively even when he was uh, he was criticizing he would always view it in terms of an opportunity to learn and improve and he would cut he would surround it with three or four positive comments and and uh uh, just follow the, uh, uh, you know, what the seven leadership skills or something. Somebody laid it out on Twitter the other day and gave all the different examples of a, uh, of somebody's set of steps for uh, 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 how to be a good leader. And uh, uh, you know, I, as, as a, a fan observer of the team, I bought into this guy. Well, even before he was called up, to be honest, I liked the way he was job he was doing down in Bakersfield, and he kept on doing that uh, that job when he got called up to the bigs. And I think he's uh, already proven himself that you know he is an NHL caliber coach and a good young coach. And uh, Edmonton needs to uh, make sure that they keep this guy and uh, uh, keep the the new trajectory. Indeed. Uh, one other comment stood out for me, Bruce, on <laughs> Philip Robery. And first of all, I want to acknowledge, like, w- Woodcroft actually pronounced his name like this, like Robery's name is pronounced in Sweden, which I thought was re- thought was really interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I just think it's a sign of respect, personally, to pronounce someone's name correctly. Even mm-hmm. if North Americans have been pron- mispronouncing these Swedish <laughs> names, Berg names, forever, forever incorrectly mm-hmm. we can change that like you know we i think we as a point of pride we, we try not to mangle people's names anymore and mm-hmm. you know as a point of respect i should yes. say we try to do that so he i think he showed philip Bowberry that respect and and we you know there's been some controversy people don't like it when we we call him by that but I'm, i think i'm going to stick to it and yeah. woodcroft woodcroft did so um and he, he also built up uh philip Bowberry. he talked about him being a heck of a player and a heck yes. of a being, and um, who, who can has who has a potential to be a very good player in the National Hockey League for a long time. <clears throat> I don't remember if it was Holland or Woodcroft who talked about how this is a really important summer for Philip Broberry, how he's been um, playing hockey nonstop. I think it was Holland actually playing hockey nonstop for a long time, and mm-hmm. this is a summer where he can re, re, regroup. I, I think work on his body, work on his fitness. I mean, he looks like. If you've seen pictures of Philip Broberry, there was one I saw of him on the beach. He looks like a, he looks like Achilles. I mean, he's a Greek god, but mm-hmm. he, Not he, uh, yes. yeah, he. Uh, so yeah, he's gonna go from that to whatever we we don't know yet. But he, Bruce, in thinking about coming years against the Colorado Avalanche, who I think are the mountain the Oilers are gonna have to climb, um, to to get to the Stanley Cup. Mm-hmm. They are going to need increased mobility on on defense, mobility, mm-hmm. agility, puck moving, and these and and size. I think is going to help as well. These are things that Philip Robery has, and um, I'm excited about the player. Like he 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 needs to improve his defensive intensity. He needs to um, up the ampage of his defensive play. In terms of uh, being a bit more nasty, a bit more forceful, a bit more commanding, he needs to be more confident with the puck. But um, I, I still like the draft pick, and I and I and I still see a player who can be a top four, maybe even a top pairing NHL D man down the road, and uh, help the Oilers a lot. And that's clearly what I think how Woodcroft's um, seeing the potential for as well. Yeah, I'm convinced uh, that we've reached the point on Broberry where the he starts next season with the big club. Oh yeah, and he'll be in the top six. And how they choose to deploy him might be third pairing, might be right side. Uh, they might choose to pair him with the veteran Duncan Keith, the way they did this year with Evan Bouchard, assuming that Keith is back. Uh, there, you know, there's there's options there, uh, but I think uh, it's close to imperative that they you know take the next step with this guy he's in the same spot now that oscar Kleppbaum was uh at the end of uh his first year uh in north america and Kleppbaum ended that year after the trade deadline with the oilers and even that fall and in, in uh, uh the following year uh he got sent down for like a week 
and then they called him up for good. And, uh, you know, and he was, uh, uh, you know, an increasingly central player to uh, the Oilers' defense going forward. And, and I think uh, Broberry's shown enough. And, you know, he does have warts to work out, but they have to be worked out at the NHL level at this point, in, in my opinion. He excelled. He did very well, at least, at the AHL level. I mean, he was his yes. point scoring was pretty good. And mm-hmm. um, so, yeah, I think definitely agree with you, which is interesting because they are talking about bringing back uh, Brett Kulak. Um, you know, there's rumors like of a three-year, four-year deal at $2 million a year. I think Bob Stoffer has floated those numbers. Mm-hmm. And um, so I'm, I'm a little bit iffy on that, honestly. Uh, I guess Broberry can play the other side. Yep. So if they were <laughs> to trade a right shot demon like Tyson Berry, mm-hmm. um, they that might be the idea. Bring back Kulak, have Broberry on the other side, and um, try that out. Which isn't which isn't a terrible idea. They also have, of course, Sam Arukov and Nima Linen coming up. <coughs> so, and Deharnay and Kesselring. There's all kinds of prospects down there. But generally speaking. Um, I mean, Sam Marukov might be ready to push for the team as well next year, but the other ones, and Nima Leinen, who, who got lots of uh, opportunity this year. But um, so Matt, that might be the idea. I liked, I did like Kulak in the playoffs. Um, his skating okay. is fantastic. He's, he, he is in that wheelhouse, like he's, what, 27, 28. He's in that, that great age for a defenseman where they've been around enough. You know, we saw the step Cody Cece took in his career, his NHL career in the last few years. Kulak is also, um, I think, ready to be. He's going to play his best hockey in the next couple of years. So I'm not a, certainly not against that idea, and, and maybe that is a really good idea to have. You need size, you need mobility, you need puck moving. Kulak offers that. Um, so you know, a third pairing of him and Philip Broberg on the other side. That's a that's kind of a, an intriguing thought for the Oilers uh, for next year. So uh, maybe that's the idea. Yeah, that wouldn't be a bad pairing either. And uh, he's, I mean, he did uh, perform pretty darn well since his acquisition at the deadline. And I mean, they paid for that. They paid a second round pick uh, in this draft, seventh round pick in 2024. Uh, they gave up William Laguson in a contract exchange. Um, so, uh, but Kulak himself delivered the goods, I would say. And, you know, as a, as a uh, uh, third pairing uh arguably second pairing at times, uh, defenseman, um, uh, not a bad player and a nice fit. So if they do bring him back, it's just don't bring him back at, you know, $5 million a year. And I don't think they're going to have to do that. I think he's pretty established as a, uh, you know, 18, 17 minute a night guy. In fact, his career high is 17.58 in terms of average ice time. So he, you know, that's, that pretty much uh, uh, puts him, I would say at this stage, an upper limit on on uh, where where he where he fits, but uh, uh, where he fits is in the top six of a good NHL team. I think so. I, I like the player as well quite a bit. So, um, you know, I, I'm not sure that he can play in the top four, but um, you know, by they have Duncan Keith again next year. He's got one more year in his deal. Yep. So they have Nurse and Keith. Yep. And uh, they, they'll have Kulak and Broberg. They have Nima Line and they've got Sam Rukov. So yeah, yeah. they can weather the storm. Like if Darnell Nurse takes longer to rehab, then um, then uh, it's, if he's missing in the first part of the season, they can weather that, I think. It's interesting, eh? Like uh, TD Force was... Ken Holland brought this up. Let's move on to Ken Holland's interview. Mm. Excellent interview. He brought up that um, he, he talked about dry settle and nurses injuries and and said at that point that TD Force had told him he wasn't expecting anyone was going to need surgery. Now, we've learned since then, yes, a pulley RV is going to be out four to six weeks with shoulder surgery. Now, but nurse, you know, the, the rumor, the buzz was he was going to need surgery after the season. And that was kind of dispelled somewhat. We'll see what's said in the next few days. But um, nurse. um I'm just wondering if they've all been influenced by Connor McDavid, you know, in the hyperbark chamber and the, you know, the high, high tech kind of like surgery is let, let the body major, heal it's itself. Yeah. but maybe, maybe they're all thinking, maybe they've been being influenced by Connor and they're thinking, I'm going to, nurse is going to try that old, uh, the, uh, Connor McDavid approach of trying to rehab a major injury first, not with surgery, but with 
uh, just, yeah, as you say, healing the body on it, on its own. It's just a thought. I don't know if that's in his mind or not. Yeah. Well, nurse was, uh, clearly, um, and this was throughout the playoffs, uh, clearly, uh, uh, sub hundred percent, and he had a, he had bad games here and there in the in the first two rounds, but you know after the second round of the playoffs, he had the uh, uh, second best plus for what that's worth in the NHL behind only Connor McDavid, who of course he played with quite a lot, and then in the third series against Colorado, uh, against higher skilled players where Colorado actually won the power on power battle. Uh, he was exposed to uh, uh, a significant degree. And you could see the physical limitations. You could see times where he simply chose not to go into the corner and even engage in a puck battle that normally you would expect him to win comfortably and sort of hang around in the net front. You had tons of people criticizing his decision-making, which, A, that's nothing new, the criticism, but, B, his decision-making, his default decision would be Sometimes I'm going to grab that puck and just skate it out of trouble, and and then they sort of check down from that. No, I can't do that. And, you know, and and there's there's uh, uh, it's not just as simple as as um, just you know changing the entire way that you play your game and just being able to automatically do the right thing time after time. And he did make mistakes. Uh, let, let, let me make no mistake in acknowledging that. But uh, uh, any uh, question of his commitment or his courage you can say well he shouldn't have been playing at all well i'm not sure that was his decision and i'm not sure that they had any healthy defenseman who could have come in and 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 done the job in a a better fashion and certainly not through the first two series and whether the injury got worse or whether they just simply faced a better opponent that was able to uh, take advantage of his physical limitations uh as for you know each individual to judge so in terms of his plus minus Bruce, i just checked our own numbers because we track mm-hmm. who made a major 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 mistake and major mm-hmm. contribution to goals for oh. and against at even strength so nurse made a major contribution on five goals for at even strength in these playoffs and a major mistake on 11 goals against now in our system of course mm-hmm. the defensemen are, are going to get dinged more because they're they're more in a position where they're going to make major mistakes on goals against just because and they have less opportunity to make um, major contributions to uh, goals for. So just like in the points, forwards are going to get more points than defensemen in our system. It, it works the same way because we're just looking at individual contributions. So 5, 4, 11 against. And I think a good comparator is Cody Cece, who played with Nurse uh, much of the playoffs, all of the playoffs. Um, he was uh, He made major contributions to four goals for and major mistakes on six goals against. So, um, and this is how I saw the two players. I thought CC was much more effective than Nurse. Nurse, um, he really did hang in there pretty well against, he looked against LA and Calgary. But mm-hmm. that lack of mobility uh, against a super fast, a team that's defined by its quickness in, in Colorado. Um, there was all kinds of plays where he just looks, he just looked like he physically was unable to move quickly enough to make the play. And as you say, like there was a couple turnovers where normally he would have just taken that puck and gone and there would have been no issue, but he was unable to do so. And he, he made bad passes. He threw away the puck and um, it really hurt the team. But um, anyway, I wonder if he'll, we'll see, we'll see what he does. First, in he was Hall- less involved in the offensive game generally, like in the season, he averaged basically three shots a game and the postseason a little under two shots a game. And I mean right. that's just one uh, one measure, but uh, you know normally he's uh, he's uh, very proactive in the offensive zone, and I think we saw a lot less of that. We did. What what's the major uh, what what quote or what uh, thing caught your attention out of Holland's interview? Why, why don't I go first here? Yeah, go for uh, it. I have it right in front of me. Yeah. The the main my, the headline was Holland was. Um, He's clearly been thinking a lot about all the players they've got to sign, you know, which include three forwards in Evander Kane, Yes, Puli Yarvi, and uh, Kyler Yamamoto, two RFAs and Kane's a UFA, three key forwards, and and Ryan, excuse me, Ryan McLeod, another RFA. So he's become another key signing here, who's probably going to get paid a little bit more than 
everyone was expecting based on his play in the playoffs. Maybe not a lot more, but somewhat more. Um, <laughs> so they have those signings to make in Kulak. They've got to bring in a, you know, probably a goalie. <coughs> so um, here's what Holland said. He said um, they're going to need a lot of the, and he stressed this a couple times. This team to get better is going to be counting on internal improvement. And he talked about the under 24 players, 24 and under players, um, a number of times and how they really need those guys to get better. And that's how the owners are going to get better. And he said, uh, to think that we're going to uh, go out and make some big blockbuster and have a press conference here. That's what we did last year with Zach Hyman, right? We got fortunate on Evander Kane. But and then he said, this is the key quote, can't keep this team together. There's no chance. Mm -hmm. The team that we just had, I can't keep this team together because of salary cap. Some people might think that's good. Get rid of some of those people, but it's the cap world. I'm going to try to make the team the best I can. I know we've got a really good nucleus. I think that was a clear signal. Uh, well, I take it as a clear signal that we're going to be losing. Of those three forwards, we're going to be losing one, maybe two of them, Bruce. And um, and it, and I'm guessing it's a long shot that Evander Kane is back. Yeah. Yeah, well, he, um, uh, you know, he played well for the team in the time that he was here. Uh, he certainly put up the big numbers. Uh, entering the market as an unrestricted free agent, if you were to put aside any of the other past stuff, a player of this ilk, uh, uh, you know, big power forward uh, who, you know, brings considerable breadth of, of game like he's a he, you know he plays a physical game he's an intimidator he's a goal scorer um, uh, he's got past history of uh, performing on both special teams and you know like there's a whole lot to like about the uh, uh, package and there's certainly lots to that the 200 hockey men would like in various markets around the uh, around the NHL and you know, he's very likely priced himself out in terms of what Edmonton can afford. And certainly his uh, uh, very gracious uh, message to Edmonton Oilers and their fans yesterday uh, bore the whiff of a uh, of a departure. You know, it's been great on to the next thing. And maybe the next thing is he signs with Edmonton. But I mean, it very, very definitely at minimum set the bar of He's now an unrestricted free agent. And he has a lot of options, and maybe Edmonton's one of them. But uh, but he's not. Uh, I'd be absolutely stunned if anything happened before July 13th. I think it is that uh, the UFA market opens on him. Be surprised yeah. extremely if Edmonton were able to uh, come up with something before uh, before then, and uh, frankly after then. I think he's gone. Yeah, the note was quite, um, many people read the note, including me, mm -hmm. I think including you, and, and yep. took it as a farewell note. And, and I'll just read a little bit of it. He says, uh, to my Oilers teammates, I appreciate each and every single one of you for welcome, welcoming me and embracing me in such a genuine way. I'm grateful to have had the opportunity to play with such a committed, mm -hmm. hardworking and loyal group of men. And that was, um, well, I've covered a lot of court cases and I, I'm familiar mm -hmm. with witness statement analysis where people reveal themselves in the things they say. And to talk about, you now it could just be meaningless, but to talk about having played, having had played with them in the past tense. Enjoyed my time yeah, here. Yeah, enjoyed my time here. I've had that opportunity. That is a clear tell from witness statement analysis of someone who's putting something in the past and moving forward. Mm -hmm. And so so I think it was it was that, along with just the it just seemed like a goodbye note for sure. Like it just totally, if he had written that same note as a goodbye note, that's how it would read. So, um, you know, but we, we don't know. We can't say for sure. Maybe he's back. Maybe he isn't back, but that's how that felt. And, and I thought it was a very gracious note from him, mm -hmm. Bruce. Mm -hmm. and, yes. and, um, a good letter, as they would say in a Jane Austen novel, a very good letter. And, um, I would say that, uh, we don't, you know, he lived up to his end of the bargain here in Edmonton. He came in here 
he, he was fantastic. He was such a great player for the Oilers. He brought the swagger back to this team. He scored. He had great hands in front of the net. He was a good running mate, excellent running mate with Connor McDavid on the ice. He was key in, be- in beating the Kings and the uh, Calgary Flames, a key player. They're going to miss a lot if he moves on. <clears throat> but he did live up to his end of the bargain here. Good luck to him. If he moves on to another team now, um, I don't think anyone should be sore about that. Um, he signed a contract. He played here. He played exceptionally well. He represented the team well. And, um, you know, good luck to him, whatever comes next. Yeah, I, I would only quibble that, you know, get, taking a suspension in the Colorado series and being unavailable to play in game four was a, a, a sad way to go out. But, uh, um, you know, stuff happens. He, he he was excellent in the first two playoff series and not so excellent in the Colorado series. But you could probably yeah. say that about a whole lot of, of members of the team. Uh, yeah. But his note that he wrote, I mean, if you took the date off that note and uh, on July 13th, he, you know, signs a seven-year, $56 million contract with Philadelphia Flyers or something, he could write the exact same note. He could retweet his own yeah. note from earlier yeah. and it would be on point, you know. He's already so, said goodbye. Like, I think yeah. that was goodbye. Like, like, honestly, that's how I take it. So, that, which mm-hmm. is fine. Like, yeah. like you know, the world moves on. And he's, well, the market he, works. He, He's had a lot of financial troubles, right? Like, it's not mm-hmm. like he could think, oh, well, I'm going to take a hometown discount or some kind of discount to play with McDavid. He, he, this is, he's got his whole life to think about. He, if he has a huge contract ahead of him, and he probably does, how could he not take it? I mean, he's, he's got to take it. So um, I accept that. Uh, let's get back to Holland now, Bruce. What, what quote from his press conference do you want to focus on? Oh, uh, hot attention. Well, the, the, basically, the comments about the uh, about the salary cap, and and uh, I think you know he said we got fortunate on Evander Kane. That's that's uh, you know what we did with Zach Hyman last year was spend a chunk of the salary cap space on him, and and uh, at least answer one big uh, glaring hole in the Oilers' top six, and and Evander Kane was the second answer that was more of a stopgap that worked out. Uh, for the most part, um, but the ability to, you know, can't bring the whole team back. Well, who brings the whole team back? When was the last time that a team just stayed the same from one year to the next in the 60s? You know, I mean, it's, I mean, Glenn Sather used to say, I want to change at least three players out every summer. And he would keep most of his team and maybe the players he moved around would be bit players. But uh, you'd look at the end of the season and, you know, hey, Ken Linsman's gone. Michael Crucial Niski's in, or you know, they they they've they've at least played around the edges. And I st- think the Oilers still have uh, uh, a little bit of work to do in the core, uh, and just to zero in a little bit more on the goaltending, because that was his, uh, you know, that was you know remains a major question, uh, and. He mentioned Smith having played banged up all year, which I think is pretty accurate. I mean, I mean, we know he got hurt in Game Three. He missed uh, uh, two and a half months. He came back. He played three games. He got hurt. He missed another month plus. And even after the uh, uh, even after the All Star break, it took him a while before he was sort of able to keep it going. But I, I'm not sure he, there was ever a point that Mike Smith was 100%. This season, you could watch a game in which he played well, and you'd find an instance where he'd go down and he'd struggle to get back up to his feet, or he, you know, there would be some tell that he wasn't, all the limbs weren't quite in 100% working order. And I think specifically there was a lower body issue with Smith. Uh, but the other issue is that he's 40 years old, and he's under contract for one more year, and the the only other goalie that they have in the organization with NHL experience has, what, 13 games of it? Stuart Skinner? 14 yeah. games, maybe? You got, I think, one last year and 13 this year, and uh, you know, he's still on a league minimum contract, and he's basically where Laurent Brossois was in, what, 2016? I mean, he's promising, he's coming up, but there's no guarantee that he's going to be a good number two, let alone a uh, future number one. So that's a that's a, a, a position that he's going to have to address. 
the default being he's already got two guys under contract for next year, so that's his starting point. Well, if you're not comfortable, and he didn't sound comfortable that he had the goaltending tandem he wanted, you're going to have to resolve one way or the other because you don't want to lose Skinner on waivers. Uh, you probably don't want to have a three-headed monster all season. And uh, if you go out and sign another uh, or trade for uh, um, proven NHL goaltender, then you're going to have to find some way to accommodate that. And that's that's a, a huge uh, priority for Ken Holland this summer. Just quickly Googling who the UFA goalies are. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's some talk that Mike Smith may retire. Like, I, I think it's been hinted at now. That, well, he uh, kind of hinted at it. I mean, he was very emotional in his in his um, post game, and I mean, maybe that's just a just a thing. But it's one way to take it was this may have been his last game. Okay, UFA goalies: Darcy Kemper, mm-hmm. Mark Andre Fleury, mm-hmm. <laughs> Jack Campbell, mm-hmm. uh, Miko Koskinen. <laughs> there you go, Billy. Problem solved. Billy Huso. Mm-hmm. Scott Wedgwood. Martin Jones. Now we're getting yep. into less interesting territory. So Kemper, Flurry, Campbell, and Huso um, are some interesting free agent goalies. No, so Kem- Kemper's struggling. Uh, he's had injury struggles, and right now he's struggling with an eye issue. Oh, oh really? Oh. Yeah, well, they got a stick poked in between his uh, in his mask in the first round, and he uh, he missed some time. And Francois had to come in in that series, and then in this series, uh, he got gonged with a shot in game one, and then he left a little bit later because he he was having trouble with his vision. And who knows if it's related to the other problem? But that's that that would be something you'd want 100% for sure. Uh, you don't want a goalie with double vision, you know. Which which puck do I stop, you know? Uh, so, <laughs> yeah. and I like Temper, and, and he's you know he's made quite a career out of it. But uh, uh, you got to make the the right choice. And of course, uh, other than these names, the other option is to make a trade. And there are there are teams positioned with their goaltenders that maybe. Uh, uh, maybe want to move on from their second guy because he's going to command a raise and they've already got a number one. <coughs> you know, like, for instance, Georgiev in uh, uh, New York Rangers has, has one example. Yeah, he didn't have a particularly good year, Georgiev. Georgiev. Mm-hmm. Um, so, might not be that. But he's expensive. definitively number two, isn't he? <laughs> he certainly he is. And has, has taken the, the mantle there, so they may just be looking to change things up and try and address some some other position. So there's uh, options like that. I, I'm not saying he's the one. I'm just saying Holland can go trade or he can go free agent and, or he can go status quo. And to me, the latter is the number three option. One other, um, <coughs> excuse me, one other um, quote from Holland's press conference stands out to me. And it stands in contrast to how Jay Woodcroft talked about Yessa Pugliarvi. Holland mm-hmm. was much more... Um, Doubtful. And he said, quote, I think he lost his confidence. He was mm-hmm. in the top six, and when he lost his confidence, he worked his way down to the bottom six, which I think is completely fair and accurate analysis, too. What is he, 24 years old? He's not really young, but he's relatively young. So I got to sort out Jesse. Hmm. Yes, sir. And, um, and then oh, he was asked, good. is he part <laughs> of the solution? And that's when Holland said, that's what I got to sort out. So that's a fairly blunt answer. Now, mm-hmm. there's lots we don't know about this situation. We don't know if Yessa Pugliarvi wants to come back to Edmonton. I mean, he at one point didn't want to be here. And uh, he's now been here two years. They've been relatively successful. Um, I, you know, according to the way we rate the game based on grade A shots, Bruce, he was one of the best orders wingers mm-hmm. this year. He had an outstanding season, um, especially that first half of the year in terms of his two-way play. Um, in the last stretch and in the playoffs, he was mediocre um, as a forward. But maybe there's extenuating circumstances due to due to injury and illness that have to be factored in there, and confidence, you know, which then flows into confidence. So he's a he's a young player. I I'm hoping he comes back. I'm hoping they can figure it out with both him and Yamamoto, bring both those guys back, 
and maybe you know replace Evander Kane some other way. Possibly Dylan Holloway steps up um, as a as a big time player on the order as a big time winger. Um, I agree with Holland's essential assessment. For this team to get better, it's going to be done internally. They, mm-hmm. they, they're pressed up against the cap. Darnell Nurse's contract mm-hmm. kicks in next year. It's, what is it, 9.25 or something per year? To, uh, it's a huge contract. So yep. They lose Koskinen's contract, but they're going to have to pay for a goalie yep. um, if Smith doesn't come back and Koskinen doesn't come back. So they, they don't have a lot of money. Stuart Skinner's definitely on the team next year. Philip Broberry is definitely like they just need these players on the team because they don't earn right. that much money. Mm-hmm. So, um, Pulley Arvey, he his bargaining power went down considerably, I think. But what's in his head about how much he what's in his agent's head? Does he want to stay? Um, how keen are the Oilers on having him back? Holland seemed a bit more dubious on the whole idea, but maybe he knows something that we he had already talked to Pulley Arvey. Right. And maybe he knows something that we don't know. Like, mm-hmm. So I, I just think judging the situation from the outside at this point mm-hmm. is very difficult. But except the fact there's a good young player there, a good young hockey player there. And if you can bring him back on a decent contract, probably not a long-term contract at this point, but a one-year deal or a two-year deal, um, I'd love to see that. I think they should right. they should hold on to him. Yeah, well, I wrote at some length about him uh, a couple months back uh, and uh, looked at, uh, you know, how the Oilers as a team did when he was on the ice. And he, he's posted <clears throat> exceptional uh, numbers in that regard. Now, I will say that his play deteriorated in the <coughs> and he wasn't as good in the playoffs. Uh, now, this is a guy who this year has dealt with COVID, uh, which apparently hit him harder than... Uh, various other players who spent time on the protocol list. Uh, he dealt with a, um, a lower body injury, which I think was an ankle sprain when he got taken down just after Woodcroft became coach. He missed a whole bunch of time with that. Uh, he dealt with the non-COVID illness down the stretch of the season. And then, of course, he hurt his shoulder in the very last game. I mean, that's a lot of crap happening to the guy. And maybe he's injury prone, but I'm just saying that's a whole lot of crap that happened to that guy. Yeah, uh, and he took a whole lot of crap, and some of it not very fair. Like some of the media questions were saying, "Well, he's only got six goals in the last 52 games." Well, you know, he didn't play the last 52 games. He played 37 of the last 52 games. So, say he got six in his last 37 games is not good. You don't have to exaggerate. Uh, at the same time, to me, if the player, you know, it doesn't matter so much who puts the puck in the net. It matters which net the puck goes into. And yes, Pooley uh led the Oilers in expected goals for percentage that the team was expected to score, based on the other stats, expected to score more goals when he was on the ice than any other uh, forward on the team. And that, you know, there, there's there's a discussion to be had there. And I, But the, the discussion is, well, expected goals for don't mean anything. I just want real goals. Well, guess what? He had the best real goals for percentage of any forward on the team. So... Expected goals was, I think, 60%. Real goals was 64%. Actually, what they did better in terms of the percentage of goals they scored than even the expected figures, which were already exceptional. So, to me, there's some real sort of solid um, uh, value in that uh, in that type of analysis. And the fact that he didn't score that many goals himself means that he should be relatively cheap compared to the value. And the f- the fact is that, you know, you can say, well, he wasn't the best player on his line. Well, sure, he wasn't. Connor McDavid was, or Leon Dreisaitl was, but they did better when they played with him than when they played with other wingers. So, he must be doing something right, would be my takeaway. Yeah, very good hockey player. Very good hockey player. And um, let me just see if I updated. Yeah, we did. Uh so in terms of goals, Bruce, mm-hmm. again, we dig into, you know, your individual contribution to goals and individual mistakes on goals against. And the best winger on the Oilers was Evander Kane in that regard. Mm-hmm. He contributed to 33 goals for mm-hmm. major contributions to 33 goals <clears throat> for even strength and mistakes on six against, which is a pretty outstanding ratio. 
Pulley mm-hmm. Arvey was next best at 39, four and just mistakes on just 10 against. So, um, you know, we had three players, McDavid, Drysaddle, and Kane, who are all just like unbelievable elite right. level of creating goals mm-hmm. and not allowing, not making many mistakes on goals against in the regular season. Mm-hmm. They were all just off the charts good in this regard. But Pulley Arvey um, was the next best forward after those um, yeah. three forwards. And uh, after that, you had Yamamoto, Hyman, and Nugent Hopkins. So, um, and so many of they, them, David, they were, a, were quite a big cut below. So many of them were goalie screens, won battles, created turnover, where you know yeah. wouldn't even necessarily show up in the in the box cars. You know, he didn't get a goal, he didn't get an assist. But if you watch the replay, that goal doesn't go in if Jesse Pulley doesn't make some significant contribution on the play. And it's, you know, that's where the video analysis comes in. And this is where uh, my appreciation of Jay Woodcroft's background as a video coach comes in. That uh, He is on top of that kind of stuff. I think that was a really great place, uh, starting point for, for his coaching career. And as we've noted in this conversation, he had more, much more positive interpretation of uh, Yes's play than maybe Ken Holland did. Alas, at this point, the uh, the next decision is uh, in the hands of uh, of uh, the GM, not the coach. Well, I think that I'm not distrusting the GM on this, though, Bruce. Mm-hmm. They have different roles, too. Yeah, right? No, I understand that. And, and um, maybe different information at this point, you know, um, somewhat. Because yes. um, Holland had talked to Pulley RV. But Holland is the GM who gave mm-hmm. Pulley RV a second chance at him. Yes, he did. You know, everyone wanted to fire him out of, into the sun, you know. Two thirds of Oilers fans were done with the player, Bruce. Mm-hmm. At least two thirds after he left the Oilers to go to Finland, and it was Ken Holland who said, "No, um, you know, we're not going to be rushed. We're going to take another look." And, and uh, you know, Archie Henderson was big on this as well, I believe. You know, the you know Holland's uh, right hand man. These guys wanted to take a second look at Yesopoli RV. Let's get the dishes, and. Uh, Doorbell. And uh, yeah, so uh, um, I think Holland has been in Yasser Puliyarvi's corner. I think he still is. I, I don't see Holland being a rash person who easily throws players mm-hmm. out the window or under the bus. And um, you know, it was a fairly sobering moment though for 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 real fans of this player. And mm-hmm. and I you know, like that he this he may not be here going forward. We'll see. There's a decision to be made, but that's the fact of this team. They're up against the cap, and it's not going to be easy to keep everybody. Yeah, he keeps coming and going, Bruce. I, I see him over your shoulder there. Mm-hmm. Every person. So anyway, we'll see. We'll, <coughs> we're going to be monitoring that, uh, monitoring that, and it was, uh, uh, you know. So the next podcast, Bruce, we'll do will probably probably be just looking more closely at some of these big decisions coming up. Right. But we'll leave that for another day for now though i think we've covered it unless there's anything you'd like to add uh well no i guess i mean yesterday i guess there was a rumor floated on oilers now about the Oilers being interested in josh anderson as a possible if they're not going to get evander kane but i'm not sure how how well that uh, says he's got five years to go at five and a half million dollars so uh. And he's, uh, uh, you know, power forward with an injury history. Uh, anyway, that's uh, if those are the options, I would rather stick with uh, some of the internal options, frankly. Yeah, 69. He's, so in the last few years, he's played, uh, Josh Anderson's played 26 games in 20, 2019-20. 26 games. In 2021, he played 52. So he played pretty much the full, full season. season. Yeah. And then this year he played 69, so big chunk of the season. Yeah, Josh 30, Anderson. 32 points and minus 25, I think he was this year. And yeah. uh, what is the year? Montreal, Montreal. Five and a half. Hmm? Five and a half for five more years. You know, the owners are going to need money, Bruce, if Holloway, McLeod, yep. Yamamoto, Pugliarvi, <laughs> Bouchard, yep. Brobery, if these guys turn out... Mm-hmm. They're going to need money. I don't like the idea, uh, honestly. I, I think Dylan Holloway, could Dylan Hall, he scored, Josh Anderson scored 19 goals. 
mm-hmm. is it conceivable that Dylan Holloway could come in and score 15 to 20 goals next year if he's on the wing? Like if he gets – Anderson was in a top six. If Holloway's in the top six next year, which is, you know, or I, – I don't know. I just don't – that doesn't – that doesn't thrill me in particular that idea of bringing in Josh Anderson, I have to say so, but I, I haven't seen the player play that much, so I can't really. I'm in the Tampa Bay camp of, of develop your own players and when they get good, pay your own players. Yes. As opposed to going out on the market and bringing in an already signed big contract or signing a new big contract for a free agent or trading your own draft picks for somebody else's, you know, to me, they, they, uh, they've got to turn that around. And uh, anyway, lots of grist for us to discuss. And uh, I'll be writing about Ken Holland's off-season priorities in my own next post called Hockey. All righty, Bruce. Well, thanks for talking today. All right. Thanks for listening, everyone. And in the meantime, and in between times, this has been another edition of the Cult of Hockey podcast.